tonight. We're very thankful you're here with us once again. We greet those of you who are with us on live stream also. Before I begin, I'd like to give a word of uh, exhortation to Sister Ada. <laughs> Tomorrow when you go to work, select three or four people that you know you can trust and form a prayer team and pray about this every day. At some given time, lunchtime or whatever, pray and watch and watch and pray. And uh, I have confidence the Lord will direct you in that. Amen. Tonight, this is our uh, 13th lesson in the book of Amos. We're going to be in verses 12 and 13. Now, in Amos, we're being exposed to what it means for judgment to begin first at the house of God. See, we'll be, this is uh, it being lived out. We're not dealing with God affirming faults, although he is doing that. But we're being exposed to what he does about finding faults. Judgment begins at the house of God. It's not that God doesn't assess puts people, is, is what people are doing at all times. He does, because by him... He is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Yeah. That's First Samuel 2, 3 says. So, But there comes a time when he quits weighing. Amen. He does give people space to repent. That's demonstrated in Scripture. He does give sufficient time for people to grow up and be teachers rather than having to be taught rudimentary things all the time. Yeah. It's his long suffering. He does that. And he did give 120 years of long suffering while Noah yeah. built the ark. He waited till then to destroy the people. But after sufficient time has elapsed, and people are still continuing in their manners, or they haven't grown up in Christ. They had to always be taught the ABCs. You've been there, haven't you, and seen this? You may be patient with it, but God isn't. And people may admonish you to be long-suffering 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years these people are given bad advice. Don't listen to them. Judgment begins at the house of God, and he's talking about in this world. And he illustrates it in, in Israel. See, they continued in their, in their manners, even though God had taking measures to bring them to repentance and stop them from doing it. To this very day, there remain an astounding number of professing believers who have made absolutely no progress toward perfection. They're all about us. They fill every church. They're in every Bible college. They're in every seminary. They're in every religious work. They're in a subsidiary Christian work. They're every place. They're in missions. They're every place. They have refused to go on to perfection. That's why they haven't. Because God has made the provisions to go on to perfection. They're all built into salvation. That if a person will be honest toward God and live for God, he'll go on to perfection. And anyone who doesn't do it does not want to do it. And God has taken note of it, and he's going to judge those people. Amen. Just as surely as he did the people of Israel. You remember, he gave people in Noah's time 20, 120 years of long suffering. 
to show you how touchy God is about people that should hear, he gave Jerusalem three years. He gave them three years exposure to his son. And at the end of that, he said, that's it. You did not know the day of your visitation, and it's over for you. You are going to destroy your city, even though I put my name, I'm going to scatter you abroad. Three years. I know people a lot longer than three years have been exposed to the truth. There are still those who uh, continue to listen to anesthetizing lectures <laughs> that put them to sleep, make them feel good, still do this. It's a serious situation. Israel had a similar one we're going to cover tonight. God will use the prophet Amos to show us how he approaches frothly, frothy and lifeless religion. I'm going to show you how he approaches it. Now we're in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. He told him he raised up Nazarites. I raised up Nazarites. That people who were wholly devoted to God. I, I raised them up. I raised them up. But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink. That's what you did. You gave the Nazarites wine to drink. And to the prophets you said, prophesy not. Behold, I am pressed unto you as a cart that's pressed that is full of sheaves. Would it? I don't want to face a God that feel, is feeling that way. Now well, let's look at this text. You might think God overlooks a lot of things, but he's going to show you how minute <laughs> his observation is. You gave the Nazarites, well, this, some Christians of our day would have done this. Yeah. Uh -huh. They'd have done this. They said there's nothing wrong with drinking wine. It said it. I've heard people say it. You gave the Nazarites <clears throat> wine to drink. Other versions said you made the Nazarites drink wine. Or to those who were separate, you gave wine for drink. You gave the consecrated ones wine. You caused the Nazarites to sin by making them drink wine because they, they were prohibited from drinking it. The Nazarites. In this case, this is a body of people. This is not a body of people, in this case, that volunteered mm -hmm. to yeah. serve God. Mm -hmm. He says, I raised up yeah. these Nazarites. So that, those are the ones we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. God raised them up. <coughs> these were a kind of hand-picked people. Their sole purpose was to serve the Lord. That's what they were, that, that's what they were all about. They did not have the liberties given to other people. There's some things they couldn't do that other people could do. They were required by divine command to abstain from all strong drink. They couldn't eat or drink anything from the grapevine, from the seed to the husk. They couldn't cut their hair. All the days of their life, the Nazarite was to be, quote, holy unto the Lord. That's things the average Israelite couldn't do and wasn't required to do. See, there are a body of people within God's people that do not have the liberties that the rest of them have. There are men that God requires more of them than he does of the other people. He gives them more than he gives the other people. They cannot be measured by the other people. Yes. I gave them to Israel. He said, I raised them up. I raised up people like this. What did the Israelites do? <laughs> Rather than honoring God by respecting his position and assisting them in fulfilling their various obligations, 
they gave them wine, bringing them down to their level. You got to see what happened here now. God put these people up here, and the Israelites brought them down here. Well, this gets pretty personal. I'll tell you, I'll tell, I'll tell you right now. Thus, the people moved the, moved the Nazarites to have less regard for God than they did for the people. They didn't drink God. They didn't drink wine because God told them to. They drank wine because the people told them to. So these people, they influenced the ones God raised up to go against God in order to please the people. Now this we face, thus we face the will of the Lord versus the will of the people. All these people, they weren't like Americans. All these people knew what God had said. From little up, they were exposed to the scripture. They were subjected to the reading of the law from the beginning of the time they were a special people all the way through. And there's instances where they deal with the long readings, every Sabbath day readings. The words of the law were to be written on the doorposts and the gates of their houses. See, every place they saw it. They were to teach these laws diligently to the children for the time their children could understand. They'd tell, they'd read, read the time these children were just a rather young age. They knew the scriptures. He said, I want you to, when you sit down in the house, to talk about these I'm showing you now, the Israelites knew what was required. Yeah. Talk about these things. You sit in your house. Talk about them when you walk by the way. When you lay down to sleep, think about them. When you rise up, think about them. That's found in Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 11, 19. As as you do. Therefore, no Israelite could claim ignorance concerning what was required of the Nazarite. They couldn't say, oh, well, we didn't under." It wasn't clear to us what the Nazarite should do. Any Israelite that said that lied. They were to, they did. Moses read it to them. Joshua read it to them. Samuel read it to them. Ezra read it to them. Nehemiah read it to them. Every time they went to the synagogue, they heard it. They heard this law, included, including number six. They heard this read all their lives. So it's not that they were unaware of what God requested. <clears throat> now, they, they gave them wine to drink in, in spite. <laughs> very clear instructions. They weren't ambiguous now. They were very, no strong drink, no wine ever. They were very clear, see? But they made them drink wine. Now, <clears throat> A similar thing has happened in our day. It might not be fashionable to talk about it, but somebody's got to talk about it. It's happened in our day. So far as the gifts, they had the gift of the Nazarite. So far as gifts, contemporary gifts are concerned, we still have prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We have the apostles in their writings, which represent their doctrines. Paul summarized it, and he said, first they're apostles, there we have it there in the writings, prophets and teachers. So these are, these are gifts that are placed in the church like the Nazarites were placed in the, yeah. among the Israelites. The modern church has pressured those gifted people like the people of Israel did the Nazarites. It should not surprise us that this actually happened. John, in his epistle, said this, speaking of false prophets, he told people, try the spirits to see if they're false prophets, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And he adds this in 1 John 2.19, they, these were false prophets, some false prophets, went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would not have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
Now, I don't doubt that some of them, if not all of them, started out serious. But eventually they deferred to the will of the people. They gave way to them. Paul said some of the elders at Ephesus were going to do the same thing. He said, of your own selves, men shall arise with perverse men, and they'll heap disciples unto themselves. See, something happened. They deferred to the people. One time with someone, I can't remember his name, we, we, I quoted the scripture, and, and he said, you know, that's a very arrogant thing for you to think that because they didn't believe what you believe. But see, what, what the person discounted was, I wasn't talking about what I believe, I'm talking about what the scripture says. That's right. But the script, a person departs from what's in the scriptures, they fall into this category. Yep. They're not one of you. That's right. Now listen. Yeah. Particularly those that are young. Anyone that tries to defend someone who says something is wrong is not honest and they are not to be heard. These people are hypocritical. Mm -hmm. You may say, well, they just didn't understand. This is not true. This is not true. Mm -hmm. When someone tries to defend someone that's speaking the truth, those people are following Satan, not God. It's the same thing as giving Nazarites wine to drink. Yeah, that's right. yeah. mm-hmm. Now, as I perceive things today, those who desire to serve the Lord, start out with this desire, have been made to drink the intoxicating wine of the wisdom of this world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what's happened. Amen. That's what's happened. I know some people didn't start out that way now. They really wanted to serve the Lord. They went to Bible college because yeah. uh-huh. they wanted to serve God. Mm-hmm. They were serious about it. They encountered some wine servers. Yeah. Amen. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. And they drank this intoxicating wine, and when they did, they broke God's commandment because God said the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Stay away from it. Don't imbibe it. Don't drink it in. And yet it is in every religious institution in the world. The wisdom of God is in it. Churches, colleges, parachurches, books, music, every place. The wisdom of the world is the intoxicating wine of the wisdom of the world. They made the Nazarites drink it. Now this didn't excuse the Nazarites, you understand? Moses took took quite a judgment from God when he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. Hmm? But when it was written up in the book of Psalms, he said it went ill for Moses because of Israel. So they moved Moses to act out of character, so to speak. They were so obstinate, aggravated him so much, he just... Lost control, and so that's written down in the book of Psalms. It went ill for Moses for their for their sakes. So I'm saying that um, God's already beginning judgment on this. If you kind of keep up on this, Babylon the Great is beginning to crumble. The things necessary to keep the institutional machinery well oiled, the economy is struck at this. Now we've got more, quote, ministries, unquote, that are in debt. We're not talking about thousands or tens of thousands. We're talking about millions. We're not talking about in a year. We're talking about in a week. This is happening. A lot of Bible colleges are having to cut back or merge with stadium schools or take some kind of action because they can't keep the oil keep the institutions well oiled they're in financial straits churches are closing by the hundreds every week why judgment has began on the house of God we actually see this happening even there's convenient explanations for People give for this, but that's the truth of the matter. You, so you gave the Nazarite. You, 
You gave them wine, they drink. Well, there's nothing wrong with drinking wine. Well, no, not for you, but it was for the Nazarites. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was wrong for them to drink wine. It was a sinful for them to yeah. drink wine. So on someone that has some kind of a liberty that is allowed at some level, try to take a servant of God and talk them into doing that, they're setting wine in front of a Nazarite. Well, you ought to spend more time in the community and learning a little bit more about becoming more involved in the community relations. Well, that may be right for some people. It's not right. It wouldn't have been right for Paul to go down and visit the Roman Senate every week. Maybe give devotions down there. <laughs> that didn't even sound right. Well, it's because it wasn't right. That's why they didn't do it. But that's not all Israel did. You commanded the prophets. Remember he said, I raised up the prophets and I sent them. They told the prophets, prophesy not. But they were prophets. See what don't prophesy. Some versions say, do not prophesy. Stop prophesying, God's word Bible says. The New Living Translation says, shut up. <laughs> Don't speak your message. See, Israel became noted for their intolerance of the prophets. Jesus said, he spoke of them as the, those who killed the prophets. Matthew 23, 1. And he stoned them. You stoned the prophets. Matthew 23, 37. Stephen said they persecuted and slew the prophets. Acts 7, 52. Paul said they killed their own prophets. 1 Thessalonians 2, 15. This is the ultimate way of saying, prophesy not. Jesus referred even to a specific prophet that was martyred, Zechariah, right in the house of God. He was martyred. Matthew 23, 35, the accounts found in 2 Chronicles 24, 21. In other words, the people, the professed people of God, did not want the message of God declared to them. And so they told the prophets not to prophesy. <laughs> Once, when Jeroboam was king, a man of God came, cried out against the altar, and Jeroboam was standing by the altar ready to offer incense, which a king was not allowed to do. And the prophet cried out against the altar. And he said that there was a king coming, he named him Josiah by name, who would offer the priests of high places burning their bones upon the altar. Oh, it irritated Jeroboam. And he reached out to take hold of the man of God. And the scripture says, he put forth his hand to lay hold on him, and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up. Hmm. Who do you think did that? No, I wasn't slow disease, just wither, just dry, withered up. Just, yeah just became a lifeless stump. There it was. Why? He took upon himself to touch the prophet God sent. That's just, God didn't do this all the time, but he did it that time, so you know. There were other prohibitions against prophesying. Prophesy now. You said to the prophets, prophesy now. This has been going on now for a long time. Micaiah, he was a kind of an unknown prophet. When the prophet Micaiah prophesied against the king of Israel, here's how the king responded. He said, take Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus saith the king, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I come in peace. Prophesy not. There's an example. <laughs> Then there was Jeremiah. The people opposed him so much, he finally resolved he wasn't going to say anything more. Got that bad. 
Here's his testimony, Jeremiah 20, 20, verse 9. Then I said, I, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of forbearing, and I could not stay, or I couldn't refrain any longer. For I heard the defaming of many. Fear on every side. Report, say they, and we'll report it. All my familiars watch from my halting, saying, Peradventure he'll be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. See, but he spoke and he spoke out anyway. See, prophesy not. See, this has been a trail of this all through. God's dealing with his people. Isaiah, he reported the desires of the people. He said, What say to the seers? See not. The seers were, that was a term they ascribed to prophets. See not to the prophets. Prophesy not unto us right things, and speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy to cease. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Help us sing a praise song or something. Stop preaching. I'm giving you an interpretation of the kind of days we're living in. We'll take anything. We'll have music. Have someone play the harp and have us sing a beautiful ode, but don't tell us what God said. Go ahead, Judah. Just using this example that you gave of First Kings and the man of God, I turned to the passage and read on, and this illustrates the power of being against God mm -hmm. and being for God. Mm -hmm. After the hand dried up, this is verse 5, the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me again. Mm -hmm. and, the hand, and the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, and became just as it was before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the power of God yeah. being for you, yeah. and the power of God being yeah. against, against you. <laughs> yeah, but again, my grandfather told me once after visiting uh, your assembly he, he compared he said the, the people in my assembly don't have any understanding and he, it, it finally hit him because he said they will never let the preacher finish a sermon because they're Pentecostal so they would always during the sermon they would interrupt it with this outburst of of you know running up and down the aisles and this and that but he saw the effect they don't have any understanding yeah. it wouldn't let the it wouldn't let the the, the, the people prophesy stopped it. That's right. Prophesy yeah. now. Yeah. Micah, the prophet Micah. When Micah declared the judgment of the Lord, the people said this. Here's what they said. Prophesy ye not. Say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. Now here's how the Amplified Bible reads this. Do not preach. Say to say that do not preach, say the prophesying Paul's prophets. No one should not babble. No one should not babble and harp on such things. Disgrace will overtake us. The reviling has no end. In other words, they're saying you, you're telling about these bad things going to happen to us, and you play on a harp and you just we don't want to hear this. Take take this noise away from us. Now there's a modern day parallel to this too. Fulfilling the words of the apostles, the time has come when men can't endure sound doctrine. They can't take it. So they heap unto themselves after their own lusts, teachers having itch and ears. So they want, now that's a way of prosaic way of saying, they want someone that will tell them what they want to hear. We can't take the sound doctrine, it's too deep. I mean, I don't have any training in the Bible. I don't understand it. I, I don't understand the Greek language or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not a student of Scripture. I just, just don't prophesy like that to me because I, I can't handle sound doctrine. Let's talk about the family. I want to hear more about the family. That's where the rubber hits the road, brother. That's where it really is. Let's talk more a little more, more about the country and the sins of the country. Let's hear that a little bit more. Well, see, there's a lot of things people would rather hear. Help us solve our problems. Let's make it relevant. Hmm. That's roughly translated, prophesy not. As the prophet Micah said, 
Micah 2, 11. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and strong drink, he shall surely be a prophet of his people. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's quite a picture, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you after I see this audience, if some guy comes along and, and all he talks about is how to have a happy life and be wealthy, he'll be, he'll be famous among you. Boy, you you'll put him on the TV. You'll support it. You may say to everybody else, you're poor, the church may have a low budget and not be able to meet it, but you'll support these guys. That's what we say today. Such prophets deliver a message that leaves the people unconvicted and comfortable in their sin. To put it in the language of Scripture, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. And they're, here's how, they're, how these people are characterized. They're lovers of their own selves, covetous, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And he is having a form of godliness that denies or rejects. See, if someone's not godly that claims to be a Christian, it's because they've rejected the power. Amen. That's why they're not godly. That equals, that state equals prophesy not. <laughs> well, Lord, what do you, what do you, how does all of this affect you? You're an almighty God. No one can make you love them less. Huh? You have this infinite long suffering. How does all this affect you? Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. Some other versions say, I'm weighed down by you. Well, when God says that to you, this, you weigh me down. Yeah. Now then, I'll crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. Or I'll oppress you just like a cart weighed down when it's full of harvested grain. Look. Look, the Amplified Bible, or the New American Bible. Look, I'm groaning beneath you. It's hard on me to be around you. That's what God's saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the Amplified Bible. Behold, I'm pressed unto you, and I will press you down in your place as a cart presses that is full of sheaves. See, the idea is that when Israel engaged in some religious service, it was like overloading a cart that was not intended to carry such a weight. Yeah. It was a burden, a burden to God. You never want to be in that point. You never want to be a point where you're a burden to God. Amen. You never want to be the sort of people that Jesus looks at you and weeps. He said, well, how often hmm, I'd have gathered you. I'd have gathered you unto myself as a hen gathers her chicks. It wasn't that I didn't want to. It wasn't there wasn't any opportunity. I wanted to. I walked among you. This is what I wanted. I wanted to gather you to myself. But you would not. Therefore, your house is left desolate. See, God takes the burden so long. Then he reacts uh, to it. And I want to stress the point that this is an aspect of the divine nature. This is, this is God reacting to this kind of situation. It helps us to interpret what is all is involved, somewhat of what's involved in Jesus coming in the fullness of the time. It seems to me that more was involved than like a, an appointed date. Iniquity was piling up. And when Jesus came, God had had all he could take. This time, instead of sending a flood, he sent a Savior. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it until he'd been weighed down. Yeah, that's God. That's God nature. So this this gives you kind of a different view of long suffering. It doesn't mean God loves you so much he tolerates you. It just means God part of God's nature is is he he lets himself appear at a disadvantage. Just wait, wait, 
weighing him down. But finally, he says he, he, he does something about it. Reacts to it. There also is a just cause for the temporary suspension of the manifestation of the full wrath of God. When the gospel, part of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, for as, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And then he tells you that God's wrath is going to break out against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's verse 18. That's going to happen. He's going to break out. In judgment against all, un, even if it's in the church. It doesn't make any difference where it's at. Uh -huh. if it's in the ministry, it doesn't make any difference where it's at. He's going to break out all of his wrath against it. But see, he was pressed, weighted down until he did that. No one but God could be pressed like that. Isaiah, now, this is how this type of religion that they had affected God. When they got together, it was a burden to the Lord. <laughs> he didn't say, oh, at last they're praising me. I think I, they've opened that portal of praise again, and I think I'll go down and dwell among them and bless them. This is not how God is at all. When Jesus said, when Jesus, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? See, that indicates that at that time, things are going to be pretty, pretty bad. Amen. God said, I was, I'm pressed. Now, I like the version of, see, I'm, I'm weighed down by you. I'm groaning beneath you. I'm pressed unto you. A lot of the modern versions, they, they don't read, they leave that out, that perspective out. They just say, I'm going to do something about it. But he says, he's under them. They're not under him. See, some of that presented as though they're under, under and he's going to crush. He's under them. But he's like going to invert the situation and put all the crush. In other words, every man's going to bear the weight of their own sin. Their sin was a weight to God, yeah. see? But unless they deal with it, and there's full provision, be swift to say, there's full provision to deal with it, find a mission for it, recover from it, God's going to put the weight on the person and they're not going to be able to survive. Yes, amen. <laughs> that does show a very interesting picture because just in, as far as our perspective go, when carrying something, if it, gets, if it gets too unbearable, the thing you're most prone to do is just drop it. It's a, so in this case, like if God's holding you up and your sin becomes unbearable, you go from up here to on the bottom. On the bottom, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Isaiah spoke of the, uh, how the effect of the kind of religion the Israelites had on God. This is found in Isaiah 43, 24. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me. See, <laughs> you made me serve. That is... I'm giving you some advantages. I'm against your enemies, and I'm. But you've made me serve with a, with a burden. Being aggravated and angry at you, this is not how you want. <laughs> you don't want to ask God to serve you. That kind of yeah. kind of say you made me serve with thy sins. You made, in other words, I've I, my long sufferings kicked in. It's for your advantage that it has, but you, you made me serve. It wasn't your cry for mercy that made me serve. It, this long suffering wasn't awakened because you sought my mercy or because you sought me. It was awakened because you were so stubborn. So I had to be long suffering or I would have liquidated you a long time ago. You made me serve, see. Wearied me. Again, <coughs> in an expression of divine weariness, the Lord said to Israel, Bring no more vain oblations. In incense is an abomination unto me. This is the God that ordained incense for them. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. 
It's iniquity, even a solemn assembly. I can't endure them. I can't stand your gatherings. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you know, next Lord's Day, all over the country and throughout the world, there'll be thousands, millions of people that gather supposedly in the name of Christ. We get, there will be a faithful remnant among them. But if people had a sensitive ear, they'd hear God shouting out of heaven, get these things out of my sight. I just can't stand them anymore. And the Israelites interpreted God's long-suffering as an approval of what they were doing. Here's Malachi 2.17. You have worried me with your words. I say, you have worried me with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we worried him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in his sight. Oh, let's put it in modern translation, God loves everybody. Let's just say it like people say it today. It's the same thing. And he delights in them. Oh, he loves everybody. He wants the very best for you, see? Where is the God of judgment? He's not doing anything, so... God says, I heard all that. Yeah. Amos also expressed God's attitude toward Israel's religious exercises. <laughs> Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I'll not accept them. Mm -hmm. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. What would happen if God out of heaven said something like that people say it's thunder yeah. that's what happened it's thunder God's, this is God though. we're reading about God Amen. here Amen. this is God's reaction mm -hmm. to corrupt religion mm -hmm. and Amos had to tell the people because the people had grown so obtuse and so dull they couldn't figure this out see there comes a point when a person gets so dominated by sin, they can't figure things out. Amen. You're going to have to have somebody that's going to have yeah. to tell them, you got to repent. It's almost good because they can't figure it out. It's gone that bad. So we must learn from this example. God can be provoked. God can. Yeah. I gave you some text there. And even to the church, he says, today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart, as in the day of the provocation. Mm -hmm. yeah. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. There were two mature men who didn't. Yeah. Yeah. That is why we are admonished in this manner. Hebrews 3.15 While it is said today... That is, this is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they did, when they had heard, did provoke. Then Paul says to the Corinthians who were provoking God at the Lord's table. He said, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke God to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You think it's just going to be that God's pressed? Is that what you think? You think it's just going to be a burden to God, that's all? Oh, he's going to turn it around. And you'll be the one, that's what he's telling you, you'll be the one that will feel the grief and the pain and the pressure, mm -hmm. you will feel it. During this period of long suffering, God is feeling it. So respond to it. Well, one time Jesus was at the synagogue, in the synagogue. There was a man there with a withered hand. And he looked out over the audience. <coughs> it must have been something to behold. Scripture says, Mark 3, 5, when he had looked round upon them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, 
Speaking as a man, it was difficult for Jesus to heal that man. Not because he lacked power. Because he had to do it, uh, do it under duress. Do you think it's still possible that God or Jesus could look at an audience with anger and be grieved because they were hard-hearted and watching the clock and wondering when they could get out? Yeah, this is the real God I've been talking about. Amen. And uh, I appreciate Amos. Mm -hmm. Amos had it more difficult than mm -hmm. we do. You see, you still couldn't shut up these holy prophets. You still you couldn't, you couldn't shut their mouths. They, they had to pay the price. Some of them were killed and some exiled. and A lot of action was taken against them, but... When they were told, don't prophesy, they did anyway. So if you're ever in a situation where someone says, don't preach, stand up and preach. Amen. Just refuse, refuse to obey. If it disrupts, let, it disru let them be disrupted. Uh -huh. yeah. If it's not in order, just make, you set the order. We need men that are this bold. Just will not, they will not. Fires, words burning in them like a fire. And they speak. Well, we want to encourage everyone who's serving the Lord. We don't want to set before them some enticement that is contrary to what serving God is all about. And I think a lot of that happens here. We are, is an encouragement. Because those who, is, who uh, labor for the Lord, they, there's a sense in which they carry a burden. It's not because their work is distasteful. It's because it, it, it requires facing unfavorable circumstances. But all of us can do a great ministry in comforting and exhorting and admonishing one another, anyone that speaks, no matter whether it's a short relatively short something or just occasional or regular or long or anyone that stands up and speaks must be encouraged Amen. yeah not to don't go weary and well doing and then the rest of us that are we've got to offer up good countenances pleasant and willing to obey and good hearty amen now and then yeah well, there's a lot there to be be learned. Any of you have something you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Aaron. Without the message of the prophets, and, and the law for that matter, the, law, the, the gospel wouldn't wouldn't sound yeah. like it like it should. Yeah. Amen. The, the message Amen. that the largely the message that the prophets bore was was this this message of, of God's yeah. holiness and and yeah. righteousness and, yeah. and indignation, but if that was just removed from the <coughs> from the record, then the gospel loses That's right. relevance. That's right. And if mm -hmm. you don't know that God is is like He said in the prophets, God he has a controversy yeah. with the people. If if you're mm -hmm. if, if a person is not first jarred by the law and the prophets, then the then the gospel doesn't have. That really that good of a sound yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but Tony, that's a good word. Now, God is bearing up under the weight of transgression and sin. That's right. That is impossible for mankind. Yeah. When when it's reversed, yeah. it'll absolutely crush man. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. That's a that's a that's a good. I had thought about it that mm -hmm. way. That's excellent. That's exactly yeah. what it's going to be. Yeah. And he's. It's, it's, it's filling the cup. That's right. You know, it's what another way of... Mm -hmm. Gives you a new perspective of sin bearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Because it all, it all fell on Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, Anna? Um, God doesn't serve you. You aren't the king. We serve God because he is ruler over all. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We aren't the king. That's right. Yes, amen. In our... Here's a promise means we've been going over kind of this very thing about this murmuring 
of the Israelites. And one mm -hmm. time they murmured, he gave them manna. Another time they murmured, he gave them water from the rock. Another time they murmured, he sent snakes among them. I mean, it just showed that it, it built up to a point yeah. to where it couldn't. They crossed a line and judgment had to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, God is demonstrating demonstrating that men really do need salvation. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, and they don't need a method, and they don't need a routine. Yeah. They don't need something that's just outward, mm -hmm. because there couldn't have been a better people who had received an ordained routine from God, and yet <laughs> they still had this fundamental enmity yep. against the living God, yes. which yes. is found by rejecting His Word. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, that demonstration is showing forth what Brother Aaron was talking about. That we do need a true change mm -hmm. at the very yeah. core of our nature mm -hmm. if we are going to possibly <coughs> walk together with Amen. God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Yeah, yeah, every sin has the capacity to destroy us. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. e e e e see, well, even as simple as eating a fruit that he said don't, don't eat. Mm -hmm. The fact is that if God, I, what I mean by it is if, if God ever... in yeah, judged you for that, you couldn't withstand the That's judgment. Right. Yeah. So the very fact that he's been long suffering with us, and 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 in order that we might see it and repent of it mm -hmm. and and obtain forgiveness, that's that's that when you see it for what it what, what God's really done in Christ Jesus, we it's salvation's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a good message to tell people. You don't have to live under the burden of a guilty conscience Amen. anymore. You can, you, can just, you can be free from yeah. it. Mm -hmm. You have a purged conscience, mm -hmm. a new nature. A, a, you, know, you can actually love to wake up in the morning and serve God. This is, mm -hmm. this is, it could be a delight. Amen. You don't have to be under this burden anymore. But see this, when you, when you see salvation for what it is, Brother Ricky yeah. mentioned it, and you mentioned this thing about God's going to flip this thing around. When that happens... It's over. There's, there yeah. is no remedy Amen. now. There came a time when God shut the door and know it's time, and there wasn't one bit of, of salvation for anybody yeah. on the outside of that boat. It was done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it says Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. Yeah. That word bruised mm -hmm. in the Bible means crushed. Yeah. 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 Now, it, do that in view of our text. Amen. Jesus was crushed. He could recover from being yeah. crushed. We couldn't, yeah. Anyone else? That kind of what you said about God waited till he it, till it, yes. it was weighed down. Then he sent Christ. That's, That's right. kind of uh -huh. set him up for the bruise to crush. That's him. right. That's Amen. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Emma. Uh, when you said if you are ever in a situation where someone tells you not to preach, get up there and preach, I thought of if you listen to them, then you wouldn't be pleasing the Lord. Mm. Good. Amen. The hearers are blessed. <laughs> yes, Brother Paul. Wine is not something that necessarily can be just handed to you as a bottle and say, here's a bottle of wine, here, have a sip. Mm -hmm. Now, that can be something as small as a little bit of leaven that works through the whole lump. I mean, that, right. and there are those types of things in the, that we see in the churches where it's just just a little bit in there. Um, not, I don't mind just that example. Um, when... In, in the world, and there, you know, there's sometimes the parties, whatever. There's a term, and to use a crew, it's called spiking. It's actually where they actually taint the bet, they, they taint something, mm -hmm. something that should not be there in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. At, you can actually increase that ratio, and over time, that person becomes influenced, more easily influenced. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a, a lot of trouble that goes along along with that lines, and so that um, you're seeing that with the again with the the, the, the creatures that we're seeing now. So, okay, they've been tainted some more and some more and some more and yeah. some more, and I want you to talk about this now. Okay. Mm. That's and that's right. their response. That's they, right. Because they do not know how to respond otherwise. Yeah, that Christ, they probably didn't give them a gallon of wine at first. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Just a little. Yeah. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your long suffering, and we thank you for your great salvation. And, Lord, Father, we confess to you that we do not want to tax your long-suffering or provoke you. So we ask for grace to walk as dear children. In Jesus' name, amen.